Our guest this week is Dr. Catherine Grill. Dr. Grill is the CEO and co-founder of Neolth, a Walnut Creek, California technology company that provides personalized mental health support to teens through a self-guided platform. Before founding Neolth, Catherine worked at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., conducting National Institute of Health research. She's also been a university professor teaching courses in psychology and neuroscience at undergraduate and graduate levels. And Dr. Grill was selected for the Forbes 30 Under 30 list in the 2022 education category. Sit back, settle in, and join us for a conversation with Dr. Catherine Grill. Doctor, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Thanks for your time today. I know how busy you are. All I can say as I've learned about you and your work is, wow. There's so much to unpack and discuss, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But first, let's start with your educational background. You have a bachelor's degree in art therapy, a master's in psychology, and a PhD in behavioral neuroscience. Where did you earn your bachelor's degree, and what attracted you to art therapy? So I started off at Northeastern, that's in Boston, and I finished up my bachelor's at Springfield. It's also in Massachusetts. I was actually studying painting originally, so I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was 18, uh, but felt like that was a good fit. Realized pretty quickly that it wasn't, but I had always enjoyed the arts as a young person. That was my kind of stress management technique. So that's how I found art therapy. I thought it would be really cool to make a career out of something that was helpful for me uh, with my mental health growing up. And so the term is somewhat self-explanatory, but help us understand the particulars. What's the history and evolution of art therapy? So my understanding, I guess there's two ways to look at the history. I mean, you could look at art all the way back through, you know, the cave paintings and how it's been such an integral part of our society. Uh, the actual term art therapy, my understanding is it became popular in around the 1940s. Uh, really something I think that started to pick up following World War II. So with the soldiers coming back home, having a hard time with traditional talk therapy, uh, they found that it was easy for them to express sometimes their thoughts through their art. So that's really, I think, when it started to become more popular. It's been more and more popular now. I know a lot of psychiatric units use it. Uh, that's where I was doing my training. And it's really something where you're working with a therapist. Uh, they're kind of guiding you through exploring your emotions, exploring things that you might be struggling with through different exercises. And you talked about how it helps you through with your emotions. Are there a certain type of people that it helps the most? Absolutely. I would say people who might have a hard time with traditional talk therapy for various reasons. So children and teens, we know is one because it's really hard to talk about your emotions. And at that young age, they might not have the words for it. Um, other folks who might be struggling to verbalize things like people with Alzheimer's or neurodegenerative disease do really well with art therapy. Uh, and also people who have undergone a traumatic experience because when that happens, the verbal part of your brain called Broca's area that actually, go, we say, goes offline or has decreased activity. So it can be really, really hard to find the words to talk about a trauma, but it might be easier to express it through art as a medium. You talk about trauma. Is this something that... Uh military or first responders can use as well? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that it could be really great in that population. And I know that there have been uh, people who have been using it in that population for sure. Terrific. So you've accomplished so much academically and professionally in such a short time that I think I know the answer to this question, but did you spend much time as an art therapist? Or did you go right to work on your master's? I went right to work on my master's. I had to do, I can't remember now, but a couple hundred clinical hours. So I worked in in and outpatient psychiatric care, um, substance abuse rehabilitation center as an art therapist. But as soon as I graduated, then the next uh, fall semester, I went on to my master's, which was a combined master's and doctorate program. You just love school is what you're saying. <laughs> I did love school um, and I was also, um, I turned 21 a couple weeks before I graduated from undergrad. So I felt young and I didn't feel like I was ready for a full-time job, but I felt like I could continue with school. So both your universities are in, in the Boston or Massachusetts area. Is that where you're from originally? No, well, I guess East Coast, but I grew up all over. Uh, my family is originally from Brooklyn. I grew up about an hour outside of Manhattan, a little bit north in the suburbs. I went to high school in Connecticut. I went to a boarding school, so I moved out when I was 14. Uh, my undergrad was in uh, yeah Massachusetts area. And then I did my master's and doctorate at American University. That's in Washington, D.C. So I have to ask, I, I live in Stanford, Connecticut, and so my listeners know that I'm a diehard Yankee fan. And so when you were mentioning Boston, 
Just making sure you're not a Red Sox fan. I just want to confirm that. <laughs> no, no, they okay. can. Um, I have a bit of an accent. And when you're in Boston as a New Yorker, they always know within like 20 seconds, you're from New York. Um, I am a Yankees fan. I All remember right. going to my first game at maybe four or five years old. You're welcome back anytime now, doctor. <laughs> so same questions before. What drew you to a psychology degree? And had that been your plan from the start? I wanted to learn more about it. So with a bachelor's in art therapy, you'd still need to go on to some sort of master's degree if you wanted to license and if you wanted to work with patients. And I ended up not going down that route. I ended up going down the clinical route because I was really interested in creating new health programs, validating new health programs that made things more accessible. Working in art therapy in the psychiatric units, you could really see quickly that a lot of times the people who were getting care were the people who had more money. And that just didn't feel fair to me. So I wanted to learn how to make things more equitable. And in neuroscience, that was really interesting to me because you can learn about something called neurodiversity or the differences that we all have in our brain and how we can use those differences to personalize treatment interventions for folks just to make them um, to better and have better outcomes. You just touched briefly on neuroscience. Take us through the field of neuroscience. You know, what is it? How is it improving our health and well-being? And what big developments do you foresee in the future that could be a real health game changer? Yeah, so neuroscience is the study of the brain. Uh, it's oftentimes a lot blended with psychology. So you might be looking at behaviors, looking at mental health care, but through that kind of biological lens. So what's really going on in the brain at a structural and we say functional level. So how the brain is built and how the brain is working. Some of the really exciting things that I'm gonna see, or that we'll all see coming out of neuroscience in the next few years is really called precision neuroscience or precision mental health care. I've heard it called, uh, been called in both different ways, but it's using biological brain markers to choose treatment interventions. So if you look at any other field of health, uh, cancer, for example, we do biopsies. If you have diabetes, we're testing blood sugar, and we're using those biological biomarkers to determine what the treatment is. But mental health is really the last field where we're not using any sort of biology, uh, but we can through neuroscience. And you can find that when you're doing kind of brain imaging or other scans, taking pictures of the brain, you're able to see on that biological level what's going on in the brain, what's wrong, and that will help you pick the treatment intervention, whether it's a medication, whether it's a behavioral therapy, whether it's um, like TMS, so magnetic stimulation. I think that's going to be fantastic because the average, I think, rate now of Struggling to getting the proper treatment for something like depression is 11 years. It's a very long time. So the goal of this kind of bring neuroscience into the field of psychology would be to shorten that treatment time uh, significantly. Well, I'm excited to see what happens because you're, you just showed so much more interest and passion and, and love and, and can't wait for the next new thing. And so I'm just anxious to see what you and your colleagues develop. Why did you choose to work with teens and young adults in this field? Teens are, <laughs> we all remember back to being a teenager, it's a tricky time. And now I think it's harder than ever with social media and going through the pandemic. In psychology, teens undergo what we call a critical period of development. So there are a lot of changes in their brain. Um, the kind of emotional parts of their brain are more developed, but some of the more cognitive parts of their brain to help them regulate emotions aren't. So that's why there's some you know, risk-taking behaviors, high emotions, things like that. And about 75% of all mental illness will be will start in those teenage years. So that's really a period where they need more support and there aren't as many clinicians in that field. So let's set the stage. How would you describe the overall state of mental health among U.S. teenagers and where the most common concerns? Is it depression, anxiety, yeah. suicidal ideation, or something else? Okay, um, to be, I'm gonna be real. I will say that it's poor and getting worse. I think a lot of people have thought throughout the pandemic, maybe after the schools opened, things would just go back to normal, things would get better. But really what the pandemic did was kind of pull back the curtain on how bad things are. And a lot of the problems that teenagers are having, they haven't gone away just because they've gone back to school. So definitely anxiety, depression, when you're looking at things through the clinical lens. But it's also important to really look at this through the environmental lens and what's going on in a teen's life. So some of the most common problems that we hear from young people would be around body image, for example, seeing you know hundreds or thousands of images every day on social media that have been photoshopped, and that can really lead to severe eating disorders that has some of the highest um, death rates, to be honest, in mental health. So those are really serious if your teen's struggling with an eating disorder. Uh, another thing that we hear a lot is around the pressure to succeed. So just this kind of immense pressure of what are my peers doing? 
how are they doing in school? What extracurriculars, what college are they going to? I have to be the best. I also have to be doing that. And it just becomes this overwhelming pressure. It's not technically a, um, a clinical health condition, but it certainly can lead to anxiety or depression. And that's also when we see sometimes these high profile suicides with a young people who seem to be doing fine, uh, but then, you know, ended up taking their lives. Yeah, you know, I've been saying throughout, you know, COVID and as we come out the other side of the pandemic, that's been the, the one positive thing about COVID is putting a, a spotlight on mental health in a positive way. And it's getting people to talk much more openly about it. Uh, you know, you talk about suicides with teens. We saw, we've seen a lot, a uh, big uptick anyway, in uh, collegiate athletes committing suicide. Um, certainly first responders. I remember very early in the pandemic that the chief emergency room doctor in New York City, she committed suicide. Um, you know, I guess maybe sticking with teens and kids, you touched on a few things, but how did it get so bad and how did we not see it? Uh, yeah, you know, I want to say it's like the perfect storm where if you look in the past you know, 15 or 20 years, the pressure to go to college has become more and more. I think if we look, you know, 40 years ago, not everyone was going to college and now it becomes this thing where everyone has to go. And if you look at Hollywood and the movies and what the you know, young kids are talking about, they're always talking about going to the IVs and have to get into this school. So there's this huge amount of pressure where they all have to kind of go down this one career path that might not, not even be what they want to do. I think that's just been getting worse and worse over the past 20 years. And then when you layer on top of that social media, uh, I do want to say there can be some great benefits of social media, especially for marginalized young people and being able to connect with others in their peer group. But it has been really bad for, for body image and seeing these kind of doctored images of people all the time and what their bodies are supposed to look like. Um, so there's been, you know, that kind of layered on top of it. And then the pandemic where from one day to the next, they were isolated, they were at home. Um, isolation is a huge risk factor for things like depression and suicidality. So it just kind of all happened at once. And I think that the pandemic was the breaking point. You mentioned Photoshopping a couple of times. And I think, you know, we can take that back, you know, to Barbie, you know, the original Barbie. And here's this perfect, you know, blonde uh, that everyone's supposed to look like. And thankfully, unfortunately, it took 40 years, but thankfully now Barbie looks like everybody. You know, we're, we're talking about mental health being taboo. Are today's teens and young people more open about their mental health issues? I would say it's nuanced, yes, but not in the way you'd think. So a lot of people would say, oh, you know, young people, there's no stigma. It's so great. They're going to get mental health treatment if they need it. That's not true. Where there's less stigma is talking about mental health on a high level and really wanting to, from this altruistic perspective, help their peers. So they want to learn about mental health. They want to bring mental health programs to their schools. They want to make sure their peers are okay. When it comes to talking themselves about their own issues, when it comes to talking to their parents, their teachers, their therapists, there's still actually a lot of stigma. So that's where we need to be uh, really mindful because they might not raise their hand and say, hey, I'm struggling, I need help. So we need to make sure that we're still doing the work to reduce stigma to get them to that point of where they're comfortable. Yeah, and, and stigma is that four letter word in the mental health space, unfortunately. And I've talked about, I've been trying to get on the show, the owner of the Indianapolis Colts, Jim Irsay, he's created a campaign called Kicking the Stigma and just very out there, very open, raising lots of funds for it. Darius Lender, one of their star linebackers is, is a big ambassador for that. And so once you start getting people like that, you've seen Michael Phelps, you've seen Naomi Osaka, you've seen um, all these you know top tier performers and, and athletes starting to talk and open up about it. Do you think that's going to help you know Main Street, Joe and Jane start talking about it more? Yeah, definitely. I mean, these people are role models, especially for our kids. So the more open they are, and the more that they're talking about their personal experiences and being vulnerable, they're really being role models for our kids that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to reach out for help if you need it. And we'll talk about your company and Neil shortly. Um, but you're talking about some of the kids here just not wanting to go through typical treatments, you know, laying on the couch, talking to somebody about it. Given today's generation of, of youth and teens and what how prevalent technology is in their lives, do you think that's the way of the future in terms of addressing mental health, certainly with younger, younger folks? It absolutely is in that it's the entry point to care. So regardless of what people think or what they want to happen, teens are using their phones as the first way to learn about mental health. They're going to Reddit, they're going to YouTube, they're going to TikTok. That's not gonna change anytime soon. So they're never gonna just as a first step 
walk into a therapist's office, that usually happens some months down the road. Of course, if they need it, we want to get them there, but we have to understand all the first steps that are happening, and that's really happening through their phone. Um, we need to be very mindful of what content they're accessing, and is it you know, reputable, verified health information. Sometimes it's not on social media. So if we can put more good health information on their phones and then even show them step by step, here's how you reach out for help, here's how you connect with a therapist, that's going to shorten that time span to really get them help if they need it. A moment ago, you touched on what COVID did to youth and teens' mental health. What do you think the long lasting effects of COVID will be on this generation? Oh, I look at it in two ways. Uh, so one, I'll, I'll talk about the little, so the really young kids. There's gonna be a lot of delays, developmental delays, I would say, or social emotional delays, because as we know with young kids, it's so important, those kind of first years in kindergarten and learning how to socialize and learning how to talk about their emotions. So I hope that the schools will do more to bring in things around mental health and social emotional learning, just to help them catch up and be where they need to be. And then for the older kids, I actually think we're going to see a lot of changes around higher education because of what you were talking about, the things that are coming out with, um, you know, a lot of students at the schools dying by suicide, not having the supports they need, this immense pressure to go to college. I do think we're going to start to see some of that changing. Um, you know, we're already starting to see less young people go to college. I think that people will really be thinking critically of, do I want to go to college or what am I studying in college and what are my career goals? So I'm curious to see that trend play out, but I think they are, are more thoughtful about, do I need to go to college right away? Am I in a place mental health wise where I can handle going to college right now? And then you'll see the flip side of that, you know, just down the road from me in New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University kicking out students who've admitted mental health issues. Yeah. How is that possible in today's world? How do they think that that's the right thing to do and that's going to help that student recover, heal, grow? It's a rhetorical question, I guess, but I just I, I <laughs> couldn't believe that they did that. Uh, I could. And I mean, here's what I'll say about it. It's very sad. It's not shocking for a lot of us who work in the field. Oftentimes, these institutions are are not prioritizing young people. They're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about liability. They're thinking about their bottom line. So if there are young people leaving, well, if I'm an institution like Yale, there's always someone else ready to take that, that child's place and pay, pay tuition. And that's actually something that we have been told by, um, by folks in higher ed. So it's upsetting. But I do think as a parent, if you're exploring college, if you have a child in college, you should be really mindful and talk to the school. What are the mental health supports that they're offering? Because you're paying a lot of money and this is your, your child. You want to make sure they're protected. So I'm not surprised. I think that we'll see even more schools coming out with these scandals because I've been hearing about this for years from the kids who I work with that um, you know, I wasn't able to get help. I was called a liability and asked to leave campus. I mean, this is a widespread problem. It's not just one university. I can't believe you've been hearing about it for years. That's mind boggling to me. Very upsetting, obviously. So maybe as a follow up to that, how would you describe the state of mental health care and services generally for children and young people in our country? One of the big issues that you'll probably hear a lot about is a clinician shortage. I would say following COVID with all the burnout, it's across all fields, but definitely within adolescent medicine. So that's that's a problem because if young people are needing to access care, they're wanting to ac access care who's from someone who's a specialist, right, in their field who understands what adolescents are going through, and that can be really hard. Uh, so I would say the rise of telemedicine has been able to help with that, you know, able to connect with people even if they don't live nearby. The other thing I would say is we need to be really mindful of what innovation in mental health care means. We've seen a lot of money, right? Billions and billions in federal funding coming for mental health care. Uh, that's fantastic. But you can't just digitize a process that wasn't working in the first place and say it's innovation because we know, right, there are so many reasons why young people won't end up in the therapist's office, whether or not it's virtual or in person. So going back to our earlier conversation about meeting them where they are on their phones, entry points to care, I think we really need to be thoughtful about that and other ways that we can use technology to innovate within the space. And how might preventative mental health initiatives help mitigate some of those long lasting effects? Ooh, I would say there are a couple different pillars around prevention and why it's so important. And of course, if you're a parent and you're listening to this, like, 
why would you ever want to wait until your child is in crisis, right? Because the risk that something could happen is so much higher. And that's unfortunately what we've been seeing in these schools. So what we want to do is get to them, the kids before they're in that crisis through education, through stigma reduction uh, and through skill building. So education, we want to teach them about signs and symptoms, what it looks like when they're struggling, when a peer is struggling, how to reach out for an adult, how to identify a trusted adult, really reduce that stigma like we've been talking about. And then also just teach them good mental health skills and how to manage their stress on a daily basis so we can try to prevent them going into that crisis state. And do you think preventive programs should be connected with clinical and crisis care services? So that more services can be delivered seamlessly and as when needed? I think you've read some of my articles that I've written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh Again, thinking about very mindfully how we're using technology to build up more programs, I think one of the things we've seen a lot is new, what you call tier one, so these preventative kind of educational programs, but they're completely disjointed from clinical services. Well, a tier one, a preventative program is a great way to identify early on if a child is struggling, if they're in crisis, if they have a clinical mental health condition. If that child is identified, you shouldn't just ignore it. You want to have some sort of care escalation and get them the help they're going to need, right? So what I've been hearing in the field is this term Band-Aid programs, especially around social emotional learning, like Band-Aid SEL. If it's just the education, but there's no connection to the clinicians, that can be a problem. So we want to make sure that we do have that seamless care and technology, particularly AI, I found is a really good way to be able to do that. You specialize in personalizing mental health support for teens and young adults through a self-guided platform. For the non-sex savvy people we have in our audience, <laughs> what exactly is a self-guided platform? Yeah, so self-guided is really a way that we would differentiate our program from something like telemedicine. A lot of people have heard of telemedicine. It's almost like a Zoom call, right, with your therapist. Uh, we don't have that. The kids aren't talking to therapists on our program. Again, this is for every child, regardless of whether or not they have a diagnosis, that kind of early intervention and prevention program. So they're doing exercises made by therapists, like journaling, relaxation practices, these educational videos, but they're doing it in a self-guided way on their phone. So whether it's in the classroom, Room, it's you know at home at night they're clicking play and they're watching those videos they don't need to have the therapist with them at that time to engage in our program and what are some coping methods or relaxation techniques that you teach oh on neos we have uh we have a kind of a wide range of going back to the neuroscience what we call top up and bottom down so top up is more cognitive and thinking about how to restructure your thoughts and then bottom up is more like the expressive arts uh, working through your emotions and that kind of subconscious level so we have let's see art therapy of course uh, cbt which is cognitive behavioral therapy which is really around kind of those thought restructuring uh, guided imagery which is a lot of visualization oftentimes of nature to help relax uh, mindfulness, which is being in the present moment, not necessarily meditation. We also have meditation, but mindfulness could be, you know, going out for a walk and putting your phone away and being really present in the moment, uh, breathing techniques, and then journaling as well. Being present in the moment. That's something I've heard more and more clinicians use. And, and I love that. One area where you've developed mobile solutions for adolescent behavioral health is through leading providers of student financial services. Why have you chosen those businesses? Yeah, they actually came to us uh, and it makes so much sense. So when you look at some of the top things that are affecting young people's mental health, financial stress is is up there, especially for all these young people, right? We have a huge amounts who are going to college who in the past maybe wouldn't have, and now they're taking on all this debt. Uh, it becomes a big issue and of course it impacts their mental health. So the financial institutions, of course, have been doing their own research around their member base, uh, their students that they're working with, and they found, hey, mental health is like the top concern, the top thing they're saying they're struggling with. Let's partner with a mental health company and let's address that financial stress and mental health component. So that's what we've been doing. And it's a fantastic way to kind of branch out from working with the schools and to reach more young people. Nice well, when they come to you, isn't it? It is. It is. It doesn't happen all the time, but <laughs> it, uh, it's fantastic. So Catherine, why did you choose the name Neil for your company? What's the meaning behind it? So NEO, N-E-O, stands for new and L-T-H for health. So we really wanted to think of a new health system where we're focusing on meeting young people where they are on their phones, preventative mental health care. Uh, and a little pro tip, it was a name that had all the open you know, URLs and social media <laughs> handles. So that did, didn't hurt either. 
didn't have to go on GoDaddy and bid up you know, for another <laughs> yeah. website that somebody yeah. had. We were talking before the break about Neil's self-guided platform. How widespread is the app's use and how much more do you expect it to be? Yeah, so currently uh, the app, the version that you see now, public version came out in early 2021. Uh, so far we're working in about 350 schools in the United States. So that's at the K-12 and higher ed level. And we just expanded through a partnership with Mango Steams into 20 countries in Asia. So working with the Ministry of Education there, integrating this program into the school. So there's been great growth. It's been fantastic, but our goal is always to support more students. Uh, ideally, we'd love to be in every single school in the U.S., you know, integrating this into the health curriculum. And how did you go about developing the app? You know, I suppose first you need to have the vision of what you want to achieve, and then you have to find the people to write the code. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And what I would say for young people listening, because a lot of times they ask me, I want to build an app. How do you do it? I would say first is a lot of years developing the expertise in the area that you're going to work. That's huge. You'll need that later on. Uh, and that took <laughs> quite a bit of time. But then once you have the idea, you build basically what's called mock-ups. We actually used Canva. So we were designing what the program would look like. And then you get together with a developer and you start building up the code. So I know in the first half of the show, you're from the East Coast. Obviously now you're out on the West Coast. Did you move out there just because that's where in Silicon Valley, that's where the, the app developers are? Kind of. It was a combination of my, I was finishing up my grad programs i knew i wanted to work in digital health and that was out here and kind of serendipitously my husband was asked to relocate from washington dc to san francisco uh, he's an engineer and he was working on the golden gate bridge the hardware and software development for the tolling system so i just felt like it was fate and i wanted to give it a chance that's awesome so even with the young people's level of comfort with technology how do you get teens to acknowledge they need mental health app and then persuade them to get it with the teens, they're they're very altruistic. They give me a lot of faith in humanity working with them. Uh, they want to help others and they want to help their peers. So if you approach a teen, maybe you're a parent out there and you've tried to talk to your teen about mental health and they get defensive, it can be scary for them to talk about themselves. But if you approach it like, how are your friends doing? Do you want to help your friends? Do you want to help your school community? They're all about that. So you can kind of bring them into a program. And this is what we do in our ambassador program and get them working on these initiatives to help other people. And through that, it will start to reduce stigma and then they'll feel more comfortable getting help for themselves. I'm not sure if you can, but are you able to quantify the app success rate? We are. Uh, I was a clinical researcher before this, so that's very important to us to actually look at once we implement the program, how is it working? So we've looked at stress, of course, that's a main component of what we want to reduce on NEOS and have found a 48% reduction in stress after 12 weeks. Um, we've seen sigma reduction in as little as three weeks. So really getting the kids on the program and after a couple of weeks, getting them comfortable talking to adults about their mental health, which is fantastic. And we've seen outcomes across all the health domains. So physical, like reduction in migraines, um, insomnia, uh, behavioral, we've even seen reductions in drug and alcohol use and binge eating behavior. And also those kind of emotional and cognitive domains we talked about, like reduced anxiety, depression, and stress. And do you have one or two success stories you'd like to share? Oh, gosh, we get uh, it's funny with kids. You, sometimes you think that they're quiet, you know, and you're not going to hear from them. But we actually get a lot of emails to our support email just from a, a young person saying, I used your program and I'm going to share my story. And here it is. Uh, one one young person who actually started to work with the company and shared their story. And this story is posted on the app. Uh, I think about all the time. She's a, a young student. Uh, from the AAPI community, there was a lot of, she talks about cultural stigma, you know, in her family and was really struggling with depression and suicidality and actually um, lost a, a cousin to suicide. And it took, you know, that happening to be able to start to talk about mental health and get mental health care. And she, like I said, you know, not only started using our app, but actually joined the company and created video series and was talking about her experiences and created a subcommittee and was working with other young students who were immigrant and first gen students kind of working through that stigma. So um, had such a really fantastic impact and has now gone on to, to graduate school to work in clinical mental health care. So wish her the best of luck. That's a great American success story, right? That's how it should be. I love that. And you talk about how long some of the treatments, you know, before we start seeing uh, success in, in the patient, how does that compare to, I'll say, traditional therapies? 
It really depends, and this is where I would say we should go back to the neuroscience and the personalized interventions. Um, wanting to be very mindful that I'm going to talk about this at a high level, and if you're like on any sort of medications, you should talk to your doctor first uh, before changing those. But I would say, you know, some people, for example, with depression, try antidepressant after antidepressant after antidepressant, and it's not working. And on average, it takes 11 years to get some sort of help for that. So that's where understanding that neuroscience really comes in because you could right away give, you know, treatment or you could give, you know, this cognitive behavioral therapy or you could give something else. But for us, you know, being able to reduce that stress in a matter of a couple weeks, that's pretty consistent from what I saw when I worked at Children's National, the pediatric hospital, and I was doing other kind of in-person stress management programs. That's a great metric you'd want to hit. We're also really proud of the stigma reduction in three weeks because that's a huge barrier to care. So if we're able to get them on their phone and in just a couple weeks feel comfortable talking to an adult, uh, then hopefully, you know, before there's the point of crisis, they can talk to their parent, reach out and get the help that they need. A moment ago, you mentioned the student who shared her story on the app and was very open about it. About the flip side on that, are there any privacy issues or concerns with the use of a mental health app? There are always privacy issues. I'll say for Neo, the students who are making content for us, uh, we get their permission, we get parental permission, and then we have our doctors kind of moderate the content and edit it before it's posted live. So a little bit different than social media where anyone can post anything. But if you're planning on using a mental health app for you or for your kids, I would say look into their data privacy, look at you know HIPAA and FERPA, it would be privacy policy just for your health information and also privacy through the schools. Make sure they're compliant with that. If you're seeing things like advertisements on the platform, like you might see on Instagram, that could be a red flag that they're you know using your data, sharing it, selling it, doing targeted advertising, uh, that might be a concern. There definitely are limitations um, by law on not being able to do that, not being able to advertise directly to children. So if there is an app who is doing that, uh, I would say that's a red flag. Is there a cost to use the app? And if so, who covers that? Yeah, there is a cost. Uh, Neos has a free 30-day trial on the App Store. So N-E-O-L-T-H, anybody can download it ages 11 up right now. And then it's $9.99, so about $10 a month to use. When we work with the schools, we have the schools actually purchase it as a school health service for the student. So it's free for the student to use. And we hope that that removes, you know, further barriers to entry. And again, I think I know the answer to this, but I have to ask anyway, do you foresee creating any other apps in the future? <laughs> People ask me that all the time. I don't know. Um, I have a lot of ideas. I will say it's harder starting a company than you think. Maybe I was a little naive. I was 25 and started this out. Uh, what I would say is, you know, if I was to work on another app in mental health care, rather than going the broad, you know, general wellness, mindfulness space, because that's pretty crowded, I think there's more work that could be done around niche areas of mental health care. So, you know, I was working with teens and young adults. I've seen some people start to support, um, young people based on certain kind of cultural backgrounds. So I think there's more work that could be done in those areas. A moment ago, you mentioned working with schools. Neil partnered with the Iowa Center for School Mental Health at the University of Iowa in February to encourage teachers, staff, and administrations in two pilot districts in that state to learn more about your app and download it. What does the Iowa Center for School Mental Health bring to the game? And was there anything special about those two districts that caused you to choose them? Or was it because they weren't special at all? Yeah, so... Like we talked about, research is really important to us, understanding the evidence base. Of course, we do our own research internally, but it's great to partner with external researchers and universities and be able to do larger studies. So Iowa was one of them. Of course, they're school-based mental health experts, and that was right up our alley. So we wanted to work with their researchers. As far as how the districts were picked, they actually selected the districts, not NEOF. Uh, so my understanding is they picked districts that had the highest mental health needs to really could benefit from using this program. And more recently, Neil announced a collaboration in September with the Media Innovation Lab at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine and four Florida school districts. Will that partnership replicate your work like in Iowa? Yeah, definitely. We're wanting to, you know, I think the important thing about mental health care is again, getting back to that personalized component. And when you go into a different community, you know, I'm here in California, uh, we're talking about here, Iowa, Florida, all very different states. They have different kind of cultural backgrounds and barriers and excitements around mental health. So when you can go into the community and partner with someone who understands that community, that can really help you tailor the program. So that's what we're doing in Iowa. That's what we're doing in Florida, um, starting in a couple different school districts in partnership with the university. 
seeing how that goes, tailoring the program as needed, and then looking to expand within the states. And what's the next step for both projects if the results go as you expect? Yeah, well, I think the results always going as expected is always, you know, you learn things. So sometimes things go well, sometimes things don't go well. It's usually a mix of both and that's okay. So as long as we're learning on, you know, how is the program working as far as the efficacy and then also thinking about the delivery, because we are taking this technology, we're integrating it into the classroom in Iowa, they're integrating it actually into their health class. So we want to see not only how the students benefit, but how the teachers are using this technology and how we can make things easier for them. So we want to use those results to improve the program. And then once we feel like we've made those improvements, we'll look at further expansion throughout the states. And are we placing unrealistic demands on educators to deal with students' mental health? And are they equipped to deal with those demands? <laughs> oh, gosh, there are so many demands on educators. <laughs> they really are. Um, and I actually have a parent who's an educator in this system now. So I'd say there are a lot of demands on educators. And if you're wanting to do anything in the classroom, being really mindful of what those demands are and then just all the burnout following COVID. But I would say you know, regardless of whether or not we think mental health should be in the classroom, it's impacting classroom behavior because the kids who have poor mental health can't pay attention. They're struggling with their grades. Sometimes they're struggling to show up. We know 64% of all dropouts are due to poor mental health. They're not graduating. So if we want our kids to perform in the classroom, we do need to address mental health. I don't think that educators need to be a mental health specialist and doing therapy in the classroom with kids. But if we can make it turnkey, we can build up the curriculum, we can build up the digital program. All they need to do is press play and then we can get some data on the kids and share it back to the school counselors. Uh, we can really reduce the workload both for the educators and the school counselors. And then we can be supporting those kids with their mental health, which has downstream effects on academic performance. And how should schools and educators be involved in supporting student mental health via preventative programs? Oh yeah, prevention. Prevention is the name of the game. I hope that we'll see more funding from the federal government focused on that versus just crisis support, which is important, but of course we don't want to wait until then. I would say the three pillars of prevention are education, stigma reduction, and skill building. So we want to teach them those three things, again, really to get them to understand mental health, how to get care for themselves or somebody else if needed uh, and make sure that they're willing to get care, right? Uh, that they don't have that stigma. Now let's talk about you a bit more. A moment ago, you talked about some potential naivety of starting your own business. What's been the most difficult part of starting Neoth, especially a business that relies on cutting edge tech? Honestly, I don't know that it was building up the program or building up the tech because I have a great team and partners. And, you know, remember, I was a research scientist, so I used to build health programs and test them. And that was pretty easy for me. I would say the thinking about the commercialization and scale is much harder because you're really trying to think of nuanced ways to do this. You're working within the school systems following COVID where there's a lot of burnout and trying to just work in a slow moving industry. Uh, so you have to get creative, and that's why we have partnerships like that financial services partnership so we can reach more young people. And has your job gotten easier or harder as the company has grown? <laughs> harder, harder. Uh, you know, it's exciting because every day you wake up and you're doing something that you've never done before. And, you know, bringing mental health care in a digital form into the schools on this scale, that's just new, right? There's a couple of companies out there who are doing it, but, you know, 10 years ago, it just wasn't happening. So I would say it's harder because every day there's a new challenge. There's something I don't know how to do, uh, but, but it's also exciting. And I think that's a big part of being an entrepreneur. And what are some of the misconceptions that people have about startups? Oh, uh, understanding the stage of the startup is important. So looking at, you can say through like pre-seed to seed, A, B, C, they do all these different rounds. But I think a lot of people hear startup and tech company and they think, <laughs> Uh, this is good for young people who are job searching. They think, oh, this company is flush with, with money and they're paying these huge inflated salaries. And maybe if you're, you know, Google, that's happening, but not necessarily as an early stage company. So definitely a word of advice for young people or even consultants who are pitching the company, you know, be mindful of what stage the company is at and tailor your pitch towards that. Uh, otherwise, you know, it probably wouldn't be a fit for the job. What advice do you have for young people and especially young women who might be thinking about starting their own business. Support is going to be key. I think I think about support in a couple of different ways. Financial, because if you're starting your own business, maybe you're, you know you're quitting a job, you're not going to have the same income. 
Um, and you might be using your own money to support the business at first. So thinking that through really well, um, especially now, given what's going on in the market, it's, it's a hard time to start a business. I also think it's a great time to start a business because there's a lot of problems and challenges. And then also thinking about that social support, uh, if you're getting it from your family or if you're, you know, you're married, you have a partner, um, what does that really mean for you and your relationship? Because you're going to be spending a lot of time on the business. So just getting those support systems in place before you start the business is going to be key. Where do you see Neil in five or even 10 years from today? There are so many mental health companies on the market and Neil has done a really good job of differentiating ourselves and kind of going after this niche, this teen space, um, which I don't even know if I'd call it niche because there's so many young people, I think 65 million teens in America alone. But I would say we will see a lot of consolidation on the market just because there are so many companies and they're complementary. So they're the kind of treatment, the teletherapy, the self-guided, the adult, the teen. So I'm excited to see where some companies start working together, whether through partnership, merger, acquisition, um, really to build up what I would call like an ecosystem of care. So one company can support, like we talked about the adults, the veterans, the kids all underneath. So. That's an area where I'd like to see Neof go is, is through more of those partnerships so we can start expanding and supporting more folks beyond the teens and young adults. Forbes magazine has been around for a long time, over 100 years since 1917. As we know, it's one of the giants among business publications, and it's well known for its lists such as the world's most powerful people and the Forbes 400 list of America's richest people. And I love when that one comes out. I never make <laughs> it though, man. I don't know what's going on there. You were named to one of Forbes prestigious lists this year, the Forbes 30 under 30. How did you and your work come to their attention and how does their selection process work? Yeah, this was a, a little bit due to my husband being sneaky. This is a story behind how I got on this list. Uh, I actually had never even heard of the list until I came out here to Silicon Valley. And I, I think it's kind of big out here. So I had heard of it, I think around the summer every year is when they have this kind of open nomination period. And uh, my husband got the idea in his head that he thought I should be on the list. So I didn't know this. He went around to our network and he asked other people and they also thought I should be on the list. So he kind of built up this network power and got over a hundred people to submit this nomination on my behalf. And that's how Forbes heard about me. I was actually um, nominated for both the healthcare and the education list because of what Neo does, we kind of fit into both categories. Um, so they had called me at some point in the fall. We did an interview, you know, with Forbes. And then you actually don't know until the day the list comes out. So there's all this anticipation, like, am I going to know? Am I going to not know? Like, so at the same time, the public finds out, that's when I found out. And it was really exciting. I made the 2022 list for um, the education category. So when you found out with the rest of the world, did you have the website up and just kept hitting refresh to see if the data was updated? Or were you just clicking refresh all the time? Or well, this I'm in California, so on the West Coast, I have the, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I usually wake up and have an email in my inbox. I don't have to wait around for it. So I had the email in my inbox when I woke up, you know, congratulations, you've made the list and here's the updated website. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. You and the company have received numerous other accolades, including being named as a top international youth mental health solution by the World Economic Forum. UNICEF and Salesforce as part of their Uplink Innovation Challenge and being recognized as a leading startup among other honors. And of course, you were featured on a display on the now famous NASDAQ Tower in Times Square in 2020. Of all your honors and recognitions, which is most special to you? This is a really hard question. I don't know if I can say. The Forbes is awesome because I get to connect with a community of other people who are doing fantastic work. And right now I'm in a group for women entrepreneurs. So we get to talk about, you know, our lives and the intersection of being a woman in business. But the NASDAQ Tower was also really cool. Like I said, I'm from New York. I never thought I'd be up there. And then all of a sudden one day, you know, my face is up there like 30 stories high. Uh, so I would say those two, um, those two are really important to me. We have just a few minutes left. You have so many demands on your time and energy. How do you strike a work-life balance and what are your self-care strategies? So being honest, I think it's always important, especially for the young people, because a lot of people will say, you know, Dr. Grill, I want to start a company. I'm like, that's great. Let's think about it. Honestly, you know what it's going to take. There isn't a great work-life balance when I mean, you're running your own company or your own business, especially a tech company. And you think a lot of times you're working more than five days a week, more than 40 hours a week. And that's just something that you, you know, going into it and you and your family decide to do together. 
but you can be strategic about taking time for yourself. So there's usually like a two hour period um, before the sun sets where I like to get outside. I have two Huskies, so I go on a walk, a hike, something with them. Uh, just take a little bit of a break from work and make sure that every day I actually put it into my calendar, but I schedule that time for myself. That's something that's been really helpful. And then having a supportive peer community, like I talked about the Forbes group has been fantastic because it's other people your age who are going through similar things and you can just talk about it with them. You talked about how big and uh, crowded the mental health tech space is. And before you talked about a few red flags to look for, what are some things that people should look for in a mental health app that could potentially benefit them? So I would say first start off with what you're wanting from the mental health app. Most mental health apps, including Neil's, are gonna be for kind of general wellness and stress management. They're not meant to be a treatment, like replacing medication. There are a couple who are treatments, but they've actually gone through what's called FDA approval. So I would say understanding that and probably talking to a doctor if you really wanna do one of the ones that's for a specific treatment of a health condition where you've been diagnosed, because that can be processed through insurance, but you often need a prescription from your doctor. If you're just wanting to learn like self-care strategies and kind of track your stress and health over time, I would say, I mean, for me, there are two things I like to do. One, I like to look at kind of the founding team. I like to make sure there's a healthcare professional on the founding team. I like to learn a little bit about their story and their mission because then I can kind of get a sense of what's the ethos of this company and, you know, how are they going to be treating my data? But then I would also look through some of the benefits on their website, see if they've done research, um, see if the benefits that they've seen through their research are related to the health outcomes that you're hoping to get. And then, you know, hopefully you can, can find a program through there. Dr. Catherine Grill, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And I'm hoping the Yankee sign Aaron Judge. I'm praying. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> And thank you to our audience for joining us for this week's episode of Next Step Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek Public Figure and on Twitter at Chris Meek underscore USA. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place with our leader from the world of business, politics, public policy, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.